This morning, we honor not just those who died in service to our country. We honor as well a combat survivor. David Martin tells us about the heroes of Iwo Jima and the last man standing. Herschel Woody Williams is literally one of a kind. At the age of 97, he is the last living recipient of the Medal of Honor from World War II. But it's the way he lived all those years since that really sets him apart. I felt that I owed back more than I could ever poss possibly give. He grew up on a farm in West Virginia during the Great Depression. There were 11 born to my family. Only five of us survived to adulthood. The attack on Pearl Harbor united Americans as never before in history. After Pearl Harbor, he tried to enlist in the Marines, but was rejected as too short. When the Marines started taking horrendous casualties fighting the Japanese across the Pacific, the height limit was eased, and he ended up a Marine. What was your first taste of combat like? Exceedingly scary. In February of 1945, a massive invasion fleet gathered off the Japanese-held island of Iwo Jima. We didn't know that they had 22,000 Japanese on the island. We didn't know that they had miles of tunnel dug out in that volcano. As depicted in the movie Letters from Iwo Jima, the Japanese held their fire until after the Marines had landed and then turned the beach into a slaughterhouse. The beach was just full of everything you can think of. Trucks and tanks, just blown up. More than 6,000 Marines would die. And just stacked them up, you know, like cordwood. Finally, Marines made it to the top of Mount Suribachi for the most famous flag raising in American history. Did you know the flag had gone up? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. I think I had my head buried in the sand. The flag was up, but the battle for Iwo Jima was far from over. There was no protection. We'd run from shell crater to shell crater if we could find one. And finally, we hit this long line and, uh, of pillboxes, reinforced concrete pillboxes. Japanese machine guns inside the pillboxes cut down the advancing Marines until William's commander turned to him. He said, uh, do you think you could do something with the flamethrower? What are you supposed to do with the, uh, the flamethrower? Put flame in the pillbox so that you would annihilate everybody within that Pillbox. With covering fire from four riflemen, Williams crawled toward the first pillbox with Japanese bullets ricocheting off his flamethrower. I look up on top of this pillbox and I see a little bit of blue smoke rolling out of the top of it. So I crawled up, got up on top of the pillbox, and here's a pipe that uh, is just about the same size as my flamethrower nozzle. So I just stuck it down and let it go. Uh, that was my first pillbox. And Williams is credited with taking out seven pillboxes in the course of four hours. That was February 1945. Peace may be restored. When Peace. Japan surrendered in September of that year, Williams was on Guam killing time when he suddenly received a summons. You're going to go see the general. And I said, what for? <laughs> Can't be good news. That, that's what I thought. I'm scared to death, but I'm following orders, you know. So I walk into the tent, walk up to his desk, and he said, uh, you're being ordered back to Washington. I'd never heard of the Medal of Honor. I didn't know such a thing existed. The boy from Quiet Dell, West Virginia, found himself at the White House, being presented the Medal of Honor by President Truman. I never even dreamed of being able to see a president of the United States. And I'm standing, shaking hands with him. Now, you talk about a scared moment. I was a wreck. I really was. He got over the nerves, but never the responsibility that comes with the medal, especially when he learned that Corporal Warren Bornholtz and Private First Class Charles Fisher two of the riflemen who had provided covering fire during those four hours of flaming hell had been killed. Once I learned that, 
my whole concept of the metal changed. I said, this metal does not belong to me. It belongs to them. So I wear it in their honor, not mine. They sacrificed their lives to make that possible. Williams learned what that sacrifice meant to their families at an early age. Remember the scene from Saving Private Ryan, where the car drives up to tell a mother her son has been killed in combat? Well, Woody Williams delivered those Western Union telegrams before he joined the Marines. When I handed her the envelope, she just collapsed. Uh, as an 18-year-old boy, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't do anything. I left because I didn't know what to do. You've done a pretty good job of making up for it. Well, it, it left a lasting impression on my mind. It made me realize what it costs just to have our freedom and be who we are. He worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs for 33 years. Afterwards, he set up the Woody Williams Foundation to support Gold Star families and designed this monument in their honor. We're in all 50 states. Does that require a lot of travel on your part? We try to attend every dedication and every groundbreaking. Before COVID hit, this 90-something would be on the road more than 200 days a year. Why do you drive yourself like that at your age? Everybody would understand if you begged off. This is my way of making sure that our Gold Star family members are not forgotten. This past April, Charles Coolidge, the only other living Medal of Honor recipient from World War II, passed away. Now you're the last man standing. Yes. Does that add to the feeling of responsibility? Yes, it does. It does. Do you ever wonder why you've been given so long to live? Maybe I'm making somebody else's life a little better, a little more meaningful. Woody Williams has led the most meaningful life possible, although he puts it differently. I'm just absolutely the most fortunate person you could lay your eyes on. And one more thing we learned about the last man standing. He's also the coolest 97-year-old in the United States of America.